Hello, and welcome to the Postmodern Iconoclast. This is a podcast where we discuss esotericism and everything on the fringes of religion and mysticism. And in this episode, I have a guest who is returning to the show. Um, Very, very exciting. And we're going to be discussing the idea of ritual within the world of Germanic paganism. There's been a lot of discussion about ritual on my podcast and within my work. But a thing that I constantly am asked about and people are curious about is what do these ideas look outside of an Abrahamic framework and within a pagan one? So I thought this would be a really good person to have on to discuss this topic, as it is something that I think people are very, very curious about. Can you introduce yourself, uh, what you believe and what you do? Thanks, Georgina, for having me back on. It's a pleasure to be here. My name's Tom Rousel. I'm a Germanic heathen, uh, or just heathen, we say, it's, it's the word for Germanic pagans, sometimes known as Odinists. I have been so for 15 years, uh, and about eight years of that, I've been uh, practicing Gothi or Guda, which are the different names for a priest within this religion. Um, first, I, pra- uh, I was a priest for I was officiating as priest for rituals among some friends in Sweden. And then when I moved to England, some friends asked me to do the same here. And it was just a case of no one else wanted to do the officiation of, of, the, of the rites. And then I fell into to the priesthood role. Uh, and now uh, having, by necessity, had to learn how to do things properly and how to make the rites work. Uh, I've accumulated a lot of knowledge on that. And so uh, I'm trying to share that knowledge with others now. Um, I also have, uh, I'm also a historian and have a master's degree from UCL in medieval history during in the study of which I learned about heathenry uh, from uh, I- medieval Icelandic and Old English sources. Uh, that was very instructive for me uh, at the beginning of my religious practice. Yeah, so I think people in general don't really understand the idea of priesthood within a pagan context because so many people think of it as like the priesthood within Christianity. What does that actually look like and what is that process like? Um, well, it really differs. Uh, first, I should talk about what it was historically and then I should talk about what it is today. Um, historically, the the Gothis in Icelandic sources, the Norse word Gothi, um, and we you know, had similar. We know that there were similar roles from earlier sources that the Romans talk about among Germanic people on the continent, but they had um, massive overlap with other authoritative roles. So, the lawyer, uh, which the, the role of the lawyer in our society is not not quite the same as the lawyer in the pagan Germanic world. Lawyers had um, a high important social status, and the lawyer and the priest and the chief were sometimes the same person or and or sometimes they were different people but these sort of roles overlapped and what you're talking about here is a a sort of a social position uh which is uh, has overlapping responsibilities and um a level of, of authority which is associated with someone of a certain social position uh so that if you were someone who was a law speaker or lawyer that meant you'd learned all the laws which is and the law is uh, in the germanic heathen worldview was just as i said you have to understand that they didn't see themselves as heathen the germanic people the heat for them like most cultures in you know pre-abrahamic cultures the their what we call their religion was just an expression of what we would call their culture and the same is the case for their law so there was no separation of church and state or anything like that the so someone who has memorized all the law would quite possibly also be very well versed in the rights and um someone in a very smaller community who was the law speaker would probably also be the chieftain because someone who has authority in law and authority in spiritual matters is someone who has general authority so that there's this overlap between these and uh obviously lear- knowing all the rights was part of it but also knowing the songs uh because uh, in although they had a runic at least for 2000 years uh at least 2000 years ago onwards for the for the last thousand years of, of germanic pagan religion there was a form of writing used known as runes it wasn't used for uh, long texts to, as far as we're aware, nothing survived like that in a runic form, very long form, you know, epics like Homer's Odyssey. 
but they had those kind of epics, but they were communicated orally in the form of songs and poems, um, which is how Homer's Odyssey would have been and uh, uh, originally communicated before it was written down. So um, these people would be well versed in the lore as well as the lore uh, for the rhotic speakers. That, uh, I had to make that distinction, and the um, not their knowledge of their ancestors, of the ancestors, of the history of their people, and of the myths involving the gods, and of the customs, and that that uh, define the the law and how people are to be judged, uh, are all interwoven to some extent, and of course the meetings that they held, uh, which were called a thing which are very similar to a parliament. And in fact, the, the parliament of some, um, some existing countries today, some regions today, including the Faroe Islands, Iceland and the Isle of Man, derived directly from uh, heathen things. Um, these were often uh, taking place at religious festivals that they were specifically you know, placed on the date of religious significance and in places of religious significance, such as burial grounds, or even in special stone circles and stone-shaped ships within burial grounds, which also contain burials. So you have this overlapping like secular functions of like legal courts, parliaments, like where people would raise grievances and discuss like the major political issues of the day. And also there would be rituals involved as well. All these things were interwoven. Now, this is not the case in modern paganism. Although uh, modern heathenry has been revived even in the 19th century and more seriously in the early 20th century, in fact, those revivals didn't lead to a constant organization uh, existing to the present day. The, the oldest heathen organizations in the world today all have their origins in the 70s and 80s and um, none of the it's because because of the scale is still quite a small religion and uh, broken up into isolated communities in in the United States in Nor and in parts of northern Europe mainly there um, they haven't got this you know caste system of like hereditary priests or lawyers and chiefs of course um, in most cases so what you find is that um, the people who are officiating the rituals are just there. That's the only, in my case, I'm not a chieftain or a lawyer. I don't um, have any roles in arbitration or like uh, diplomacy or punishing uh, criminals or anything like that. I just officiate at rituals. And the reason I do so is because a group of heathens come together and we want to worship the gods and we cannot do so unless someone will officiate and perform the rituals. Uh, that person is a godi, they're the priest. So in this limited version of this ancient uh, role, we see people stepping forward into it. And of course, rather than being initiated by, uh, you know, uh, uh, by their father or like a, a priesthood, um, they will they will have to just devote themselves to study, uh, as I have done for many years. Uh, and that, that will be the source of the knowledge that will enable them to do the rituals. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I've noticed with my experience with um, groups that I've been around um, different types of traditions, but that each individual organization does completely radically different ways of operating ritually. Is this true for heathenry? Like, is there a really big variance going on? Yes, there is. Um, they, uh, the... Uh, this has been the case since the beginning, I think. Some of the early groups, the important groups that began it, uh, the pioneers of the 70s and 80s that still exist, um, they successfully established uh, rights that, that the members of their congregations or hearths, usually these groups aren't called hearths, they can be called fellowships or um, communities or whatever, and they're broken up into regional hearths. Uh, with temples called hofs. The, te the terminology actually varies between different groups, actually. But um, the, they, they, they successfully established these rites 
uh, and and so they stick to them because they're you know rightfully proud of having established them and often they wrote down books and uh, you know system systems of how they want to conduct the rites now a lot of, a significant number like as with other pagan religions a significant number of the practitioners are actually lone wolves if if you like they don't belong to any group and they sort of do everything as they please and they disdain these uh, larger groups of established rights so that's one reason for divergence uh, then there are also smaller groups who pop up and completely uh, set up their own rights simply because they're unaware of the larger groups and their established traditions but also in more recently especially in the 21st century uh, in the last 20 years or so there have been several groups uh who have committed themselves more thoroughly to historical accuracy and so they try very hard uh in various different ways and uh, to different extents to make the rites more like what is attested in historical materials and then there's big disagreements over whether that is the right way to go about it because some will say you know they had they change their ways so why do you try to stick and also why do you want to calcify the religion at a specific point in history uh, which was one accusation that some would launch against some of these groups whereas the other would answer uh, that to to the uh, the more the established groups from the 70s and 80s that often they have become influenced by whether consciously or subconsciously or you know by sort of osmosis from their proximity to other kinds of pagans non-germanic even influences sources uh, one of the things that was quite influential on the early ideas of germanic heathenry uh, revived in the 80s is uh jungian psychology and that on both sides of the atlantic that's really important for how people understand uh heathenry actually in the, in the, its early stages people f- definitely saw it what you know wotan as this emergent archetype in, in the jungian sense of course that doesn't have that that sort of that doesn't exist in the uh, in in the in the older sources for that religion uh, other things as well like um some of the runic one of the early uh, authoritative sources within the heathen revival on runes specifically was edward torson and his book rune law was considered you know definitive uh, for for many years and he certainly was uh, in many ways a uh, an educated scholar of runes and of Germanic paganism, but his systems that he developed were not based on historical Germanic paganism. He in, included influences from Kabbalah and uh, many and, and many other things. So it's just not, and in fact, that wasn't even something that he began with, because even um, in the early 20th century, with um, the Arminist movement in Germany, it was a German sort of Theosophical break off of the of the theosophists of Helen Blavatsky and Co. People like um, uh, von Guido, if that's how you say his name, they he developed an entire made up system of rooms that didn't exist, and also a lot of the like. Uh, I mean, it didn't exist historically, and a lot of like the ideas of rune and that Germanic magic that were invented in those days were just like made up or based on other things like Kabbalah. And of course, and like you have runic yoga as a thing that was quite popular in the 90s, for example. So obviously it just takes the Indian tradition of yoga and sort of tries to mix it with runes. So some of these innovations and um, syncretic developments uh, were quite well established as like widespread things that you'd see in many different heathen groups uh, by the time, by the late 90s, early 21st century. But then there'd been an, a, a sort of opposing uh, pushback on the other heathen groups who want to remove those elements and try and make something that they see as more pure. Um, the problem is that all of these groups are relatively small and heathenry is is still a, a niche religion. So these arguments are, are quite personal and not uh, and concern a small number of people. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not a reconstructionist myself. People who listen to this podcast will know this. And I wonder if it would even be possible to fully disconnect from these influences, because you can certainly attempt it. But since they are so deep in all the material people are reading, I think, is it possible to even get it out of like a subconscious influence of what you're doing? You know what I'm saying? I think that that's a whole tricky can of worms. That's a really interesting point. I think... um... The, there is a kind of like general cultural ideas of what of, of 
concerning like the occult and religion and spirituality. And these aren't necessarily absorbed directly from their, you know, from lit literature or from other heathen groups. I think the theos like theosophy has such a wide ranging influence indirectly through fiction and like, you know, people who, you know, Victorian authors were writing about spiritism and this kind of comes into comic books in the, in the 20th century and then from comic books to movies and people who might consciously think that they reject theosophy may uh, inadvertently have like absorbed through cultural osmosis a whole load of assumptions about the spirit and, and, and ideas like this from, uh, you know, new age or Victorian uh, spiritualists uh, without knowing it. So, um, yeah, I think it, it's quite hard to do that. And, and of course, like people, I mean, this is the problem that Christians had when they were fighting against heathen, heathenry because people would convert to Christianity and be 100%, you know, I am a Christian, I don't want to be a heathen at all. But they, just because they have been so fully immersed for so many centuries in a heathen worldview, they couldn't just get out of it. Uh, and we discussed this last time I was on your podcast, like there are 10th century Christians who absolutely would abhor anything pagan who believed in Woden or Odin and uh, included him in spells written in Christian contexts. So it's, and I would not call those people heathens because even though they did perform rituals for Woden because they didn't think of themselves as that. It's just that they're so culturally immersed in it. So the only people who can really uh, uh, actually pass these influences, any kind of influence like that from their practice are those who are aware of it. So only by first becoming aware of it can you even start to to do that. So I, 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 my, my opinion is that I don't want to tell people too much about what not to believe or what not to do, but just to show people what is attested and how um, your ancestors actually, what your ancestors considered a proper way to appease the gods. And then, you know, leave it out there, see how people want to integrate that into their rituals uh, and encourage them to try to do things the way that their ancestors did. Because what is definitely a very well attested uh, cultural worldview of Germanic people is that the authority of their religion was based entirely on the sort of maxim, well, my forefathers did it, so I'm going to keep doing it. That is that is their main argument against Christianity, and that's their main argument against any kind of change to their rituals. Basically, like, the ancestors were seen as an authority, and you're, you were obliged to do as they did and uphold their, their honour and sing their praises and defend uh, their memory from any slander. So this is like a part of that culture. And as I said before, the culture isn't really separate from the religion. Uh, and th that's why that, that, that's why it had such, you know, it's the last uh, pagan religion in, it, with the exception of the Baltic, it's the last Indo-European, you know, pagan religion in Europe. And it endured among uh, Germanic people right up until, you know, 1300s, Middle Ages, um, uh, or even later, if you look at some uh, legal records in Sweden, and even later still, if you look at the fact that the Sami, a fin uh, finno ugric people in um, in northern Scandinavia, uh, who actually adopted some Norse pagan gods into their beliefs and they worshipped for themselves right into the 1500s. Yeah, so a lot of these like new pagan movements that we ref you were referencing a little earlier are very practice heavy instead of doctrine heavy that seems to be a pretty consistent trend with them like a lot of the expression of these religions is what you do and i'm curious when we look at these germanic pagan type traditions are we seeing a lot of that like is ritual sort of a thing that is so part of it that you kind of have to be doing it right you kind of have to be living it in that sense is there any of that i guess the word would be orthopraxy going on with these reconstructed traditions Yes, and also with the with the invented ones too. There is that that the the invented one the, the groups who have invented practices are quite um, adamant that there's orthopraxy, and you know uh, I um, have been removed from a, a a group I won't mention here because of my uh, failure to 
to, to maintain the exact uh, rituals as they had um, had specified that they should be practiced. It, it, because of, because I'm, my commitment is to my ancestors and doing things as they did. So I, I have, uh, that, that's my, my primary um, objective. Uh, at the, 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 the rituals of the Germanic pagan religion aren't as well attested in any source, classical or medieval, uh, as, for example, the Roman religion. Uh, or, of course, with Hinduism, we have very good like surviving ideas of ritual because the, the Rig Veda uh, r- writes down, actually, it s- tells us how uh, some rituals were conducted, and it, uh, it includes prayers. Um, we, with the Germanic sources, the two main books, the Prose Edda, which is a Christian commentary, on um, is a commentary by a Christian chieftain, Icelandic chieftain, a um, couple of hundred years after the conversion. Uh, and then other, other other is the Poetic Edda, which he, is a compilation of poems that he compiled, of, which predate the conversion. Uh, and they're very well uh, known among heathens and have always been. But because those don't include any description of rituals, or even there's only even one prayer in the whole thing as well. That has left a lot of room, which people wanted to use for innovation. Um, and then once having innovated, they don't want to, they don't want other people to innovate. They want to establish orthopraxy uh, because that would maintain that defines their group. It defines it, it gives them something to unite them as that's what ritual should be something that unites the community in their worship of the gods. And there needs to be some conservative instinct there to preserve the ritual as it ought to be. They only, resort, they only resorted to innovation because they didn't believe that there was any other option uh, and they needed to worship the gods. But um, actually other sources do have descriptions of rituals. And um, if you look at the sagas, if you look at the descriptions by the Arab author Ibn Fadlan, who, who witnessed some pagans, if you look in some Anglo-Saxon Christian sources, if you look at laws passed by, if you look at both heathen laws, which survive in various Germanic countries, and also Christian laws afterwards, which ban certain heathen practices, you'll, and also if you look at Roman descriptions, all of these contain insights into the rituals practiced by Germanic heathens. So we don't, we, we're not as blind as people assume we were, and those uh, valuable sources were, I think, quite overlooked in the early days of uh, the he- revival of heathenism. Uh, but now I think there's a lot more, the internet's helped with a lot more information to be shared more easily. And so that's partly why people want to like, revisit the uh, what some of the customs that have become orthodox among so many heathens, some of the beliefs that have become orthodox, and say, let's kind of rethink this because that's not actually what our ancestors did and and we can do better yeah that makes a lot of sense so one of the common themes that i've noticed looking at different religions around the world is there often is to some extent a sort of divide between ritual and magic as a concept that's illicit and some that are illicit like good and bad or like things that are allowed and things that are not allowed does such a dichotomy exist within germanic paganism or is that not really a thing that translates to that paradigm. Um, you mean a paradigm, uh, like a dichotomy between magic and and ritual, or magic and prayer? Or? No, like a dichotomy between like magic that is considered virtuous, or I mean, sometimes the term witchcraft will be thrown around, like things that are considered good versus bad. Does that exist, or not so much? Specifically within the context of ritual. Yeah. Um, y- there is certainly, this is another thing that people debate. Um, some groups, for example, uh, I'm in contact with uh, friends with people in the Norina society, and they would um, class Saider as black magic. They use that modern term to, to typify it. And certainly um, Saider is a stigmatized pra- magical practice within the Norse world. But I think the problem with black magic using the term black magic is that you've got like good magic and bad magic right but um it's quite it's much more nuanced within what we know of germanic heathenry there are certainly cyber to explain is one form of divinatory magic that involves use of threads 
And because it, it simulates weaving somehow and manipulating the threads of fate, which, you know, control the future and every man's fate, um, because it, that's a gendered form of labor associated with women, therefore this form of magic is gendered and it's shameful. There, there's a very, um, there are very set and fixed gender roles within the Germanic culture. And so to transcend those roles is shameful. So therefore it's not appropriate for men to practice that kind of magic. Uh, this kind of magic had two main forms. One of them was divinatory, like using those threads to determine what will happen. And the other was more like a kind of shamanism where the practitioner would spirit travel and go and harm people, maybe, you know, make them sick or whatever, or go, uh, otherwise do something to hurt them. Now, what is it that makes this black magic? If you say it's because they harm people, well, the problem is we know that heroes and like, you know, otherwise people who are not considered shameful used runes to harm people, used runic curses to harm people. So we can't say that the reason it was shameful, it was it's black magic is because it harms people. Well, the other thing, because it's divination, well, divination had so many forms of, uh, of, of magical practices within Germanic heathenry. Like there are loads of different forms of divination. They loved divination. In fact, that's one thing that, that like two different Roman sources uh, that we have on Germanic paganism. The Romans said that this really defines Germanic people. They're obsessed with divination. They won't do anything without casting runic lots. And after they cast the lots, then they have another form of divination to check that those lots were correct. So like they're really uh, extremely immersed in it and they use animals like horses, pigs and birds to, to determine the future. They can use weather. They use, yeah, runes can be used, as I said. Uh, they use... Um, there's the scyther. There are many, and I actually talk about some of those in my course, starting heathenry. Uh, to, to go, if you want to know about more of them, but um, the the point is that the it's not. It certainly is true that they didn't like witches. So this is often we talk now about whenever we talk see a, a female magical practitioner in in a, a Germanic source, we think a good translation would be a witch because people know what that means. That makes a lot of sense. Within Germanic paganism, is there an idea that parallels like mysticism or theurgy? Are those type of concepts um, existing in any way? Parallels theurgy and what was the other thing you said? Mysticism. Mysticism. Um, well, I think that theurgy um, is in many ways was unique because Yambacus is trying to develop a system for you know, the, you know, the ascent of the soul through ritual. And even within his own trad Hellenic tradition, although he wasn't a Hellen by, by blood, but his Hellenic tradition didn't have that, really, a formalized system for that. But his, the rituals uh, that he was using were the rituals of the Hellenic tradition. Uh, so I'd say that in a sense that all Indo-European religions require the use of ritual as a way to interact with the gods. Yes, that there was a, a theatic system. But if, it, if you mean something more specifically um, about the ascent of the soul, where it can transcend, uh, you know, like attachments of some kind, uh, that, I, that, that's not attested uh, very clearly in any heathen source. That makes a lot of sense. So when we're looking at like prayer, um, obviously prayer exists in this tradition. What would be the dividing line between prayer or ritual or is in a sense all prayer an act of ritual? Um, yeah, I'd say that they didn't really have prayers without ritual so much. The prayer was a ritual. Um, it's hard to, we only have one source uh, of an actual, something that could be written down at which we can say that looks like a prayer in the in the in the written sources there are also some runic inscriptions that sound like prayers but they're not so very different from magical charms for healing and curses in you know they invoke a, a being and ask them to do something in every case so that that i'd say this becomes within germanic heathenry like what we call magic is like the kind of things that you see in the pgm for example are very similar to 
kinds of magic in Germanic tradition, but also to prayers. And I don't think there's a great, a very clear distinction between prayer and uh, other, uh, and things like curses and um, protective charms and things like that. You're asking, you're invoking, you're asking, and you're getting something in return, and you usually give something. So I think that um, you don't pray unless you give in, in, in most Indo-European religions. It certainly seems that way with Germanic um, as well. So if you're going to be, if the prayer is going to be accompanied by an offering, then it's then it's a ritual. So I'd say that the, the prayer and ritual are uh, explicitly tied together uh, in this context, historically. But of course, nowadays, if we're talking about modern practitioners, I think a lot more people will consider um, now that singing the praises of a god is a form of an offering or that just you know sitting and 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 praying to a god is a form of devotion and this comes from a general as we're talking about cultural osmosis from like years of of immersion in like a christian and platonic idea of relationship to the divine where things like devotion even like the india developed this with bhakti as well like the idea that devotion itself is an offering is so widespread now that um, it's, it's obviously worked its way into modern heathenry as well. That makes sense. That definitely is a thing that I think people are really steeped in. Um, so if someone were to, say, get really deep into Germanic paganism, would they have to detach from that and switch back to like a traditional offering framework? Um, or does that still kind of work just in a less traditional way? Well, I've got friends who do things like they set they they lift weights and say they dedicate this this set to Thor because Thor is a god of strength and they think that if they dedicate the set to Thor, then he will give them more strength or something like that. So that works in the you know theological system, the idea of reciprocal relationship with the divine, a, a gift cycle where you give and receive. But I don't do anything like I mean I lift weights, but I don't. I've never dedicated a set to Thor because I don't. I don't think that that personally. I don't think that's an offering. Like it has to be um, strictly speaking, it has to be a sacrifice. Now, obviously, that was originally blood, um, but that was in an agro, you know agro, agro pastoral society where value was mostly assigned to livestock. The Germanic word for wealth, feo, the, the Germanic root for wealth, feo, originally meant cattle. And it shifted to meaning gold and money because when they shifted from economies that were where, where the movable wealth was an actual cow to one where you had minted coins, it made sense for the coin to become that, the, the, what the cow had previously represented. Um, but the, they definitely did give money as an offering. So we, we know as well that they gave beer as offerings and other things of value, like weapons were given as offerings. The, the, the constant here is value. It has to have material value. And that I think that that should be maintained because this is something you can adapt it to make it modern to our, con our, our context. Like, I don't own any cows. And if I went and bought a cow and sacrificed it, it wouldn't really represent the same value that it did to someone in a... Uh, in, in, in a, a pre-modern society. So to, to think about giving up value to the gods in exchange for something from them, you've got to think about what would be an equivalent offering within your cultural context, within the economies that we now live in. But it still has to be, to maintain this ancient tradition, something of material value, in my, uh, my opinion. So I, I encourage people to actually give something, uh, something that they put, they've spent money on, uh, that, that the gods would value. And since we know that alcoholic beverages were um, such important symbolic value within uh, the mytho, mytho ritual context, uh, having mythic equivalents and, and, and having such important function within rites that we know of, I generally say that uh, libations should be the focus of our, of our blood, which is what we call our rituals. And um, the, the, these should be things of value. So not a cheap drink, something extremely valuable, special drink that you that you the best you can afford that you want to give up, uh, and then you can expect something of value in return. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, do you think um, since people were obviously livestock was their career, would it be valuable for someone to 
make the offering like based on like what they do or their lifestyle or their personal career to make it more personal to them? Well, I dedicated in the final part of my course, my online course, Starting Heathenry, I dedicate it to uh, to God, to Woden and Ingrifrey. So that's not something that we see attested historically, but it was a it was a, a, a labor, it was a work of mine, and I wanted to dedicate it to them as an offering. Um, so, so I, I think that kind of that adaptation can happen, can be done, and it, it naturally it felt felt natural to me, and it's excuse me, it's something that the uh, various modern groups do and encourage. For example, the Rune Guild has um, a tradition of what well, they require their um, members to have dedicated a great work of some kind um, to the gods. So. Um, the yes, I can see that that would be that would make sense, but it's not something I would say can replace a physical uh, offering of value, because I created that cause for although I wanted to help people the gods in the sense I want people to be able to worship them, I created it for more for the people so that they know how to uh, worship the gods and for me as well because I want to make a course, so I have something to offer to people. But the, um, the, 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 this is something that is not to replace traditional Indo-European and Germanic ideas of gifts, of giving and receiving from the gods. You, you, you have to have a physical ritual with a physical offering as well, even if you're going to dedicate, you know, if you're a software developer and you want to say, you know, I dedicate this software I've made to this god, uh, that's fine. Uh, it couldn't hurt. But it's not a it's not a replacement for actual ritual practice. That makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned the use of alcohol and wine in ritual and um, you know libations and all of that. Is there a heavy use of intoxicants or entheogens in rituals in the Germanic pagan world? There's no evidence of ritual use of intoxicants uh, in Germanic heathenry historically. But there has been a lot of ink spilled on this subject because, and I've been one of the people writing about it, that there are a lot of people who infer that there should have been some things that there, there probably were um, uses of entheogens in their rituals. That I, 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 One of the things people say, for example, is psilocybin mushrooms. They grow widely in Northern Europe. Like they grow every autumn everywhere. And especially where there are undulates like deer or sheep or all the thing all the livestock that people in northern europe farm so you you can't escape uh, those little things popping up everywhere those mushrooms but there is absolutely no evidence they were used at all historically in europe um uh, before the modern period that doesn't mean they weren't but there's no proof of it and there's a lot of somehow it's entered into popular consciousness from like academics speculating that it could have been the case that there was used to then people depicting it in fiction. For example, the History Channel's Viking series, they take mushrooms in that. And in the Northman film, they take magic mushrooms in that. So they, there's this constant depiction of Germanic heathens taking magic mushrooms. And as a result, of course, a lot of neo, uh, neo pagans, a lot of modern heathens use magic mushrooms in their rituals. But this is definitely an innovation. It might be based on um, informed scholarship, but it, there is no evidence that it was it was used. There is evidence that they used, they had, they, they did definitely use um, henbane, which is a, a, a very powerful um, psychoactive substance. Uh, and that's attested uh, in the Roman period, uh, 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 is found in, uh, in Holland, uh, in Roman ruled uh, Netherlands. So that's a Germanic area ruled by the Romans. And also in the Viking Age, a, a thousand years later. So we can infer that henbane was widely used among Germanic heathens in the intervening centuries. But was it used in a ritual context or was it used in a medical context? Or is there any distinction between a medical and a ritual, uh, religious? Because in many cultures, healing is part of religion. It's part of a ritual religious practice that invokes gods and spirits to help to heal. So it's um hard to say but uh, we know also later on in in other parts of europe like spain in in the middle ages henbane was called the witch's um witch's potion or something because it was used by witches for spirit travel 
uh, had that effect. So we maybe guess that Germanic witches were using it in that same way previously. They definitely used it, but how? And uh, as again, I'm going to say there's no certainty that there's no mention of the use of any kind of entheogens in any ritual context in, in uh, among Germanic people. But you have to, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong to do it. Uh, although I definitely caution people to be very, very careful when using uh, those kind of substances or, or, or even using them at all, because um, I do believe that they, as people claim, that they make people more receptive to certain entities. But I don't think that that's necessarily a good thing, especially if they're not, um, if they're an impressionable person or uh, uh, vulnerable in any way, because you don't know what you're making yourself, uh, you know, receptive to. Yeah, that makes sense. That's that's pretty much how I feel about that subject, actually. Um, so one thing that I'm curious about is what big misconception or misinformation do you think people have about ritual within Germanic paganism? The worst one, um, one which I, uh, I have to respectfully disagree with some of my senior um, co-religionists who, uh, who, who established this convention. Um, I don't know it, where it begins, but I think it, it comes from actually before the heathen revival uh, among some like um, some German writers claim that the, you know, that bowing before the gods was an obsequious uh, you know, Middle Eastern superstition that the true Germanic Teuton would never do. And, and in the 80s, it became established among certain important heathen groups on both sides of the Atlantic. And, as a re and it still survives among some people today. And these, like, these are prestigious people who established this right. So it's like, looked on, it was looked on as quite a, well, you know, it was so widely established among heathens that it was just seen as a part of the heathen religion, that bowing to idols was some kind of like superstitious foreign thing. And that's what distinguished us because we Northern peoples are too proud and dignified. And we look, so we would stand and look our gods in the eyes as equals or something along these lines. But there are so many sources, so many sources that, uh, that show that that just is not true at all. They, they definitely, we have like, archaeological sources of people kneeling. We have loads, a, a dozen or so written sources from Iceland, from the aforementioned Arab, Ibn Fadlan, from Romans. All of them say Germanic people uh, prostrated themselves or kneeled in some way, made some form of submissive gesture before the idols of their gods. So it's really, and in fact, there is an example in an Icelandic, uh, one Icelandic saga of a, um, a boy, only a small boy, a minor, I think he was like 13 or something, called, uh, I think his name was Bui, and he was half Irish, and perhaps due to Christian influence, he must have been half Christian, he refused to bow, and he was to an idol, and as a result, he was outlawed, and this is really severe punishment. Uh, to be outlawed meant that you're no longer protected by the system of law, which is defines like all order and civility in that culture. It almost makes you not a human being. You can be killed legally if you're an outlaw. You're not an, anyone who al allows you to stay in their house. It, it can be you're brought to legal charges as a result. So you basically it's almost like you have to be exiled you have to leave this is basically a death sentence in most cases but it without actually being killed like without being you know executed you and someone will kill you or, or something terrible will happen to you you can't even seek shelter in anyone's house and to do this to a 13 year old boy um now obviously this is the culture that thinks it's very very important to show physical reference to the idols of the gods so the idea that you don't need to is just completely wrong um, and, and easy, easy to demonstrate that it's wrong. That makes a lot of sense. And with that, I think that's a pretty good place to leave off because I think, you know, that's like a number one thing that I've heard, not just from 
heathens. I've heard that from a lot of people. The whole bowing is Abrahamic thing, which I've I find rather annoying and pretty clearly not true. So great final thing. Um, where can people find you? Where do you exist on the internet? And where should people go to learn more about these subjects? Well, my I'm known for my YouTube channel called Survive the Jive. And you can easily find that just by Googling Survive the Jive or looking for it on YouTube. I'm, a, I'm active on Twitter as well. Uh, my name's Tom Rousel there. But um, I, if you want to learn more and you think you're like the sort of person who would, should be practicing the Germanic heathen religion, but you're not sure where to start, then you really ought to get my my online course called Starting Heathenry, which is available at startingheathenry.thinkific.com. And it's also linked uh, via my Twitter profile and on my website, the Survivor Jive blog. And it's uh, basically five hours or so of video content broken up into more than 50 little videos of about five minutes in length. And they... Each one addresses a very specific thing you need to know about heathenry in order to perform the rituals and make your own rituals rather than telling you this is the prayer you've got to say, this is the ritual you've got to do. I tell you the format and structure that you need to know so you can make your own prayers if you want to and to make your own rituals, but they have to conform to this structure according to historical sources. So it lets you really starts you off whether you're going to join a group and practice with other people or whether you're going to be practicing alone this will give you everything you need to know so that you can do that uh so it's, it, it basically if you've got if you haven't got time to read the books or you're not a very bookish person and you're intimidated by all the like huge amounts of sources and the fact that there's so much content out there on, on people with conflicting opinions arguing about different stuff you just want some authoritative evidence-based you know source-based clear, concise uh, lessons on how to be a heathen. This is for you. It's called Starting Heathenry. Um, yeah, and I'll have all those links in the description. Either if you're watching this on YouTube, it'll be in the description. Or if you're on a podcasting platform, you can look at the show notes. I'll have everything linked. Um, this has been your host, Georgina Rose. You can find me under Dot Darling, D-A-A-T Darling, on every platform under the sun. Um, pretty much everywhere. Um, and this show is supported through Patreon. If you join the Patreon, you get every episode early. You get a bonus episode eight times a year. And you get a mini pre-show, which is like a 10-minute solo show that I release with every episode, just for you guys. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, this has been the Postmodern Iconoclast. And have an amazing day, night, afternoon, mid-morning, mid-evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are.